So bless you, Mark. What do you look for in an accompanist? Hey everyone, greetings from the campus of the University of South California. A lot has happened since my last vlog. I've been halfway across the world, played a bunch of shows with a bunch of awesome artists. And in addition, I've been spending a little bit of time over here in the University of South California in Los Angeles. One of my absolute most favorite piano players in the world and one of my biggest heroes and influences, Mr. Ruffalo Ferrante, had asked me to sub for him for a couple of weeks at USC. So for the past three weeks, I've been teaching piano lessons and coaching ensembles. I recently came back home from two joint tours. First, with Mr. Larry Carlton, who's a legendary guitar player, who I'm sure you've heard of. He's on more than 3,000 recordings, has more Grammys than he knows what to do with. Played on Thriller, played on Steely Dan. Straight from the tour with Larry, I hopped on a plane to join the awesome Shoshana Bean. Shoshana is a joy to work with. So what do you want to be when you grow up, Shoshana? <laughs> uh, I would like to be um, a billionaire when a I grow billionaire. up. billionaire. <laughs> How deep is the ocean? How high is the sky? Shoshana now has her own solo career, but for a while she was a huge Broadway girl was the main lead in the musical Wicked on Broadway. What do you look for in an accompanist? Gosh, I think it takes a really versatile player mm -hmm. to be an accompanist for me. Obviously, it's important to me that someone uh, is good with locking a tempo and has a great, solid pocket. I really enjoy playing with people who who are brave enough to have a conversation with me. Someone that's willing to live and breathe in the moment right. with me, if that means the tempo's pushing tonight, or if the tempo is kicking back tonight, or we're gonna loop the tag or something. Mm -hmm. Just someone who is able to live and breathe in the moment. And then I'd say the last thing is like, especially when you're maybe gonna go on the road with somebody, is like, the hang, like right. just their energy and their vibe and being around them. Young musicians don't understand just how important this is. Yeah. Like how percentage-wise, what amount of time do we spend on stage as opposed to the amount of time we spend <laughs> with each other elsewhere? The amount of everything else is greater than the amount of time I spend. The amount of preparation, so rehearsal, traveling, yeah. packing, unpacking, prepping, the hang, yeah. everything is greater than the amount of time Absolutely. on stage. Absolutely, like Truly. the amount of time on stage is actually the smallest part. It is the smallest part of our job. Of our um, those would be my top, I think that was top five That things. all makes perfect sense, but why the hell did you call me this? <laughs> <laughs> Sky. Looking back, it's been a busy year. I've had a lot of tours, a lot of shows, and it's still not over. In the meantime, I've been releasing some really cool lessons on this channel about motivic development I'm really excited about. It. You guys seem to like them very much. I'm going to be releasing a lot more in the days to come and the weeks to come. So after having taught here at USC for a good couple of weeks and uh, after coming in contact with a lot of really talented young people, I had this realization that I wanted to share with you guys. 
and this is about the development of a musician. I find that the development of a musician has sort of two main chapters. The first chapter is where every time you acquire like a new technical skill, you grow a lot. Or every time you transcribe a solo, you grow a lot. Every time you learn like a couple of tunes or you learn like a new little thing or you improve your time or you work on a polyrhythm, every time you do that, you grow a lot. And like those things like really improve you a lot. This typically happens at the earlier stages of one's musical development. And that lasts for a while until at some point it kind of stops and then you can keep acquiring language, you can keep improving your technique. You can keep learning more tunes, learning more polyrhythms, but none of those things will really give you that next level growth. The things that used to propel you enormously when you first started will at some point stop propelling you this much, even if you keep acquiring more and more of them. And that is because at some point your growth as a musician becomes conceptual growth. In other words, what might take you from bad to mediocre or from mediocre to good will not take you from good to great. The journey from good to great is almost entirely conceptual. Conceptual in the sense of how you hear music, how you make decisions in real time as you play, how you respond to other musicians, whether you're able to spot opportunities to make the music more interesting, the decision making, you see. All of these things are conceptual things. Like, I know plenty of piano players who have the same technical abilities as Herbie Hancock and know as many tunes as Herbie Hancock or more and played as many gigs as Herbie Hancock. But none of them are half as good as Herbie Hancock. <laughs> and that is because of the conceptual difference between them. Herbie has profound concepts about music from which he operates. And of course, enormous talent and originality. But again, you can't close that gap by transcribing five more solos. You can't close that gap by learning seven more songs. You can't close that gap by playing 25 more gigs. At some point, growth becomes a matter of your inner concepts about music and how those come into play in your music making. And where do you even learn that, right? Who even teaches those things? Those are some pretty abstract things. Hopefully you figure them out based on recordings of great players and hopefully you have a teacher in your life who can actually take you there at least a little bit and I know I had one such teacher in my life his name is Hal Crook and I'm sort of trying to be that teacher for the young people today here at University of South California where I've been teaching for the past couple of weeks and I tell my students here all the time I say look you're at a point where you're already good for a lot of things you guys can already play a lot of gigs and make money and work and you'll be hired, right? The next chapter of your growth isn't gonna come from transcribing two more solos or five more solos. The next chapter of your growth isn't gonna come from playing 20 more gigs or learning more jazz language or learning more tunes by heart. The next chapter of your growth will come from the expansion of your conceptual understanding of music, of your real-time instincts as you play. If you choose to play this, why do you choose to play this? What in the music informed you to play that? If you're playing this, if you made this decision, is it because of autopilot and muscle memory? Or is it because something in the music told you to play that? Because your inner listener is examining the music all the time and attempts to balance the music in various ways. In other words, what are you hearing when you're playing music with the band? What is occurring to you? Are you on autopilot? Are you registering the various events that are happening? If you've been playing halftime for a while, are you registering that you've been doing that? Are you registering that maybe now changing it would make the music more interesting? And you see, this kind of stuff is a matter of decision making. And this decision making is entirely and purely conceptual. And you really have to grow here. Which I think is why most people become mediocre or good, but very rarely great.
So those are just some thoughts I've had this afternoon after teaching several students and coaching several ensembles. Thank you.